welcome everyone. Um, if you've been at any of the other talks, uh, you know that this is kind of a little regular thing that we do at Midelta. Um, all our resident artists uh, give a short presentation to uh, our peers, our local community, but we're doing it in Zoom this time. So, um, so I'm glad you all made it. Uh, first of all, um, I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement. We honor and acknowledge that we are on territories and traditional lands of the Siksika, Kainai, Pikani, Stony Nakoda, and Sutina, as well as the Cree, Sioux, and the Salto bands of the Ojibwa peoples. We also honor and acknowledge that we are on the homelands of the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. We acknowledge all Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Inuit, and Métis who have made Southern Alberta their home. So, um, so today, I just realized just before that we had, it's like the, the BC, um, it's a BC group here. So we have, um, we have three speakers, Marita Manson, Brianne Sue, and Amy Duval. Um, oh, and also I'll just let you know that uh, talks are about 10 minutes long and then we'll have a short five, five minute or so Q and A afterwards. So if you have any questions for any, for them, uh, please um, either put them in the chat or just unmute, mute yourself and ask questions. So first up is Marita. She is a Victoria artist um, here for two months. And uh, she was one of the artists who was uh, postponed because of COVID. So I'm really glad that she actually made it here. So, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, if Marita could start. All right. How was that? Perfect. Good. Um, okay, so as mentioned, I'm Marita. I'm from Victoria, BC, um, where I'm a ceramic studio technician and instructor at the Cedar Hill Arts Center. Um, okay. Oh, hang on, I'm having an issue. Does not want to advance. Oh, okay, I got it. Um, so, uh, oh, for my presentation today, I'm gonna start with like a little bit of background about my biography, and then I'm gonna get into a little bit of a talk about what I'm doing here specifically at Medalta, and I'm gonna read a little piece of writing that I did. So just fair warning when that happens, you'll know what is going on. Um, so I was born um, on the west coast of Canada. Um, I grew up on Vancouver Island, and as you know, the 80s were a uh, bold time for design. I was born in the 80s and there was lots of bright colors and patterns and um, we had a lot of that in my house when I was growing up and that aesthetic has remained really prevalent with me throughout my life. Um, just some photos of me as a kid. <laughs> um, so I did my undergraduate degree in science. I majored in microbiology um, and I spent about eight years in the field um, before deciding that it wasn't really the right place for me. I've always been a pretty creative person, so it's difficult to be kind of trapped in the lab all the time. Um, but I have found that my science degree has been like a really good grounding for my art practice. Um, I find that whenever I have challenges in the studio, I can work through them in a really analytical way um, and often kind of treat my studio practice like, like I treated the lab. Um, so I took a hard turn into the arts um, I started out in art history and architecture. I was very interested in brutalist and modern architecture. Um, and it was while I was taking a class on <laughs> Italian Renaissance interiors uh, that I became really obsessed with objects in the home and their ability to be performative. So that is to display status, taste, or class. Um, and this has shaped a lot of my philosophy on making. I, tend to not make like what I would consider a kind of more beautiful, timeless, utilitarian ceramics, although I do really love them. Um, and instead I find myself creating like what I would describe as a strange artifact that's maybe reflexive of like the current zeitgeist. Um, so this is some of my early work. Uh, in 2012, I started working with clay first at the university and then um, for a few years out of a local community studio. Um, and once I started, I kind of like abandoned every other career idea that I was thinking about and just focused only on clay. Um, so you can see in my early work, I was developing some more personal surfaces that were um, inspired by like bacteria or things that I was looking at in my microbiology training and also um, uh, 
like inspired by some architecture, definitely. Um, so in 2016, I decided to pursue a formal ceramics education. I went to Kootenai School of the Arts in Nelson. Um, they have a 10 month intensive studio ceramics program there, which I took. And it was around this time that I started to view my work, I would say like more sculptural. Um, and although I have worked in functional work since then and um, always focused on functional work, I think that function for me is kind of secondary to the form. And so, uh, yeah, I've made a lot of uncomfortable handles in my days. <laughs> um, that's the name of the game. Um, oh, and in 2018, I was uh, able to go to Iceland to continue my technical training. Um, while I was there, I studied uh, mold making and casting. Um, and as well, I developed some of my own clays that you can see in the bottom right corner there and a lot of my own glazes. Um, this set on the bottom left was like, used every technique that I learned while I was there. So it combines using the plaster lathe. Um, I made some tools so that I could sledge the top middle photo there, like a, kind of like extruding plaster, and then um, used a lot of math uh, to cut and assemble all the pieces to make these this uh, masterpiece that I then was able to make molds from. Um, and then when I returned for the last few years, I guess I've been based in Victoria. Um, and was lucky to be able to set up my own studio there. Um, I've been doing production out of it since then. And I uh, started kind of producing more, what I would describe as minimal for me, thrown items, um, black and white. And then I really wanted to move my practice towards more hand building, get off the wheel and introduce a lot more color in my work. Um, and so this is my current body of work, which I've been making for a few years. I kind of describe it as like pop art microbiology. Um, this work is made from cone six stained paper porcelain. Um, I roll it into slabs and laminate the slabs to get the checkerboard patterns or the like kind of quadrants on the cups. And then I roll really thin sheets of colored clay, dry them a bit, because it has paper in it, I'm able to cut it with scissors. And then I can kind of like collage the surfaces to get this uh, unique kind of surface treatment. And I really like that these pieces have a lot of visual interest, like areas for the eye to sit both inside and outside of the cup. Um, and then more recently, I've been uh, interested in like kind of removing <laughs> function from my work maybe completely and starting to work in sculpture. Um, these are a few pieces from my first sculptural show a couple of years ago. Um, I started out just kind of transferring my current surface treatment and building methods um, right over to sculpture, but I found that when I was trying to scale up the porcelain, I was getting like a lot of cracks and problems. Um, and so my impetus for applying to the Medalta Artisan Residency Program was to spend some time um, exploring some new sculptural clay bodies and different methods of building that have been kind of closed off to me while working in porcelain. Um, so while I'm here, I'm hoping to explore both larger scale items, but also make some smaller representational items and kind of try and build a sculptural, personal sculptural style. Um, so this summer I was kind of looking for a question or concept that I could use to tie my goals for my time here at Medalta together. Um, and as I deal with my own aging memory, which it seems to be rapidly aging, I've been quite uh, interested in the, in the subject as a whole. Um, and I practice a lot of memory strengthening techniques and I've been researching into the malleable quality of memory. Um, so I was considering this while I was spending some time at my family cabin pictured here uh, in the Gulf Islands. And it's a place that's really filled with memories for me. And um, the cabin was built by my parents in the late 1970s. And we have spent every summer of my life there since I was born. Um, and my brother and I continue to take over the property now. Um, so I was swimming off the rocks below my bedroom in the bioluminescence at night. And I was looking out across the water to see the moon rising over my neighbor's boat, the Naomi, and realizing that I had swum in the same spot on the same black and sparkling ocean every summer of my life, I began to feel all the years run together. My memory of this place felt like an undulating ocean filled with objects, stories, smells, and faces that couldn't quite be placed in time. Some of the more static objects, like my favorite cup or the pattern of the wood grain on the ceiling, just floated on the surface of the sea, seemingly unchanged throughout time. 
But when I pulled on these items, it seemed that there were others that were tethered to them beneath the surface, and they would then bob up, looking decayed and eroded from their time beneath the sea. I focused on the memories floating around me and grabbed onto one. It was the familiar smell of matches burning as they turned to ash and twisted away. And this brought back the taste of fresh briny oysters cooked in their shells on an open fire. And then another, a warning, or maybe a joke from my father, to hold the crab just so, or risk losing your finger. I realize that the cabin itself and all of its contents are somewhat of a memory palace for me, holding together the history of all my collective summers. As I age and my memory warps and changes, it gives new, new life to old stories and blurs others together in a timeless haze. Uh, so as I said, I'm hoping to create some small and large sculptural items, which I want to assemble to create um, kind of that imagined interior, like a roomscape of my memory palace, um, like I was describing in that little writing piece. Um, my goal eventually would be to install like a full living room scene where there's small items or vignettes um, that kind of capture my memories that are displayed on like fancy shelving along with tables and chairs, which would invite the viewer to come in, engage and relax. Um, and I want the work on hold to question the accuracy of memory and highlight its malleable nature by creating objects which are at once like recognizable, but also no, maybe not quite right. Um, and I want the pieces to have kind of a fluid feeling running through them with some items maybe melting or dripping away. Um, so these are some of my first tests, my first stool that I made <laughs> and my first shelf prototype and my uh, uh, anyone who's in the studio has seen me making so many scallop shells, which I hope to turn into a mobile, similar to what I grew up with. Um, I'm hoping to create an interior that feels familiar while being somewhat unusual, as if it's like from a dreamscape. And so these are some of my source images that I've been pulling on, of course, Ikea catalogs from the 1980s, um, and some Star Trek interiors. Um, and there's one of my first shelf prototypes. I've had about two weeks to work so far on this project and I have eight total. Um, so I'm hoping to inject like quite a bit more color into my work. As you can see, I'm quite interested in color. Um, so if you wanna follow along, you can check out my Instagram account. And I wanna give a special shout out to my mom who's here today for digitizing all of these old family photos to help me make this presentation. Thank you, mom. That's all. Wow. Thank you, Marina. <laughs> I hope it wasn't too long. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Are there any questions for Marina from the, the guests? Um, oh, I have a everyone. question. Oh, yes, yes, please. Sorry, I always have a question. Um, <laughs> I, I really, yeah, I'm really interested in the, uh, the whole like framework of like memory being malleable because I remember like growing up with, I have three brothers and as adults, we like argue yeah. over memory now and who, like what happened to who. And we've yeah. all heard the stories so many times that we absorb these stories as being our own memories. So um, I'm just wondering like, where where are you like researching for, or where are you getting your research from, or like your sources, I guess, on the like malleability of memory? Because I'm also just very curious. Oh, <laughs> I was like, cool, because I can give you some cool places. I mean, I listen to a lot of podcasts when I'm working in the studio. Um, okay. So I've actually just been Googling like podcast memory, podcast memory, and then listening to like some, there's a really nice radio lab episode about memory. Um, okay. And then uh, I've been listening to some more like science-based podcasts, which are maybe not as like enjoyable for people who maybe aren't super into science like I am, but I can for sure, I can't remember the name of, there was another really good episode of a podcast that I listened to. I think those are the best sources because it's just so nice to hear somebody like describe in a beautiful voice what's going on i love podcasts yeah. oh yeah definitely yeah. you're like the studio go-to now i feel like for a lot of people yeah okay cool yeah no uh give me your list later if you're willing yeah i mean if you google just like radio lab memory you'll get a really nice hour-long segment about that's like a nice intro and then i can give you more if you want oh cool thank you mm -hmm. oh nur has a question hi nur oh hello Hi everyone. 
Hello. Hello. Hi, Medalta family. It is the correct. <laughs> uh, hi, Marita. Nice meeting you, and thanks for for that uh, very uh, nice. Not chronological only, like the layout of the you are taking us your journey. <laughs> yeah, bunch of collages. Yeah, and I I really like to the way you are sharing. I'm sure all of us, it's moved us, especially after pandemic, the pandemic that how much we separated and then how much we internalize in our memories during that time. That's you brought very warm side of that in our making, being studio. I'm a ceramic artist and also right now I'm becoming a kind of arts educator that I'm really working on them, how our memories, I'm getting involved more and more questions how our memories are, especially childhood, how it shapes us. It's called formative ages or years. And then you bring in your, uh, in your making and studio, this is it's a kind of comment, but it's more than question, it's just interrogation of that. I'm trying to understand how do you share this with a private area in some point to make your art function for the audience. How, how do you, what are your strategies that to reach the audience, feed them, to bring them? It's, it's about the exhibition uh, strategy or it's about the, how do you write about it? How, how yeah. do you connect? This is my curious part. And I, 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 I mean, appreciate if you develop it. Just yeah. to open the conversation, not a question. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm struggling with the same thing, but yeah, that's part of the reason why I wanted to create kind of like a scene that was inviting for people. But uh, as you probably noticed, I do enjoy to write as well. So I, that was me kind of starting a piece of writing that maybe would help you guys access what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking when I'm making it. And so I think there will probably be more writing if I if I do eventually show it um, in person. Then yeah, I would hope to create some more writing pieces that can go along with each of the piece, each of the little vignettes that I will install as well. Yeah, because your work is has lots of ethnographic parts, mm -hmm. and then it has it's very juicy, it's nice, you know, it has <laughs> to be. Uh, it's it's connecting each of them. It, it's it's this a collective. A approach but at the same time very individual so that taste has to be reached by the viewer I believe that's why I want to say that ethnographic part has to be also coming outside yeah. from my understanding thank you so much thank you <laughs> thank you Noor are there any other questions if not we'll we'll move on to Brianne but I, I I think we'll have some time at the end too if you, have, if you think of anything afterwards because I'm that type of person who thinks <laughs> of something way too late. So, but, <laughs> but anyhow, Brianne um, is from Burnaby and she's one of our year longs here. I'm excited to see what she's going to be up to this whole year. Um, so yeah, Brianne, you could share your screen and hey. Okay, I'm going to time myself just to make sure I'm under <laughs> my 10 minutes. Okay, uh, hi everyone, I am Brianne, and yeah, I'm from Burnaby. Uh, I was born in Vancouver and I grew up in the metro Vancouver area. So yeah, I'm here for a year long, so I think I can get lots done here. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to start off with my education. Uh, I got my bachelor's from Emily Carr. Uh, uh, these are these are both campuses. So I was at both campuses, so that's why they're two photos. <laughs> um, and it's really funny. I, I like loved art since I was young, and uh, I actually went in to Emily Carr thinking that I would do sculpture. But then I saw that they had wheels in the ceramic studio, and, and then I took a ceramic design class, and then I completely fell in love with the wheel and ceramics, and I just never left. So I'm gonna be showing you some work from my time there. 
Uh, this is a piece that I did in third year. Uh, it's called Forgotten. Uh, it is an interactive installation. Uh, how this came about is that uh, my grandpa actually passed away that year and my family and I went to Hong Kong and it was my first time participating in these traditional funeral practices. So a way to pay respects to our ancestors is using small ceramic cups and we pour wine on their gravestones. Um, also, like uh, another part of it is that we burn paper money and the more you burn, the richer they are in the afterlife. So I was kind of playing with the quantity of things, hence there are so many cups in this installation and it's actually based off of uh, Chinese mythology. And uh, when you reach the end of your life, you pass away and then you meet the goddess of forgetfulness and she gives you this concoction and it wipes away all your memory from your past life and then you are ready to be reincarnated. So because I was inspired by this story, this mythology, I actually represented that goddess of forgetfulness in this installation and you were asked to walk the path to me and I served you rice wine and uh, people drink to forget, so I used rice wine. And uh, after you drink it, uh, you place it anywhere along the path. And then, yeah, that was part of the act. And I used traditional uh, blue and white colors. Uh, the way that I glazed them kind of represented the fading of memory to a clean slate. And yeah, I was just kind of playing with this idea of doing this act before the end of our life. Like no one really knows what happened after that. But yeah, I was kind of playing with that idea. Um, next up, I have an installation. Uh, it is called Flow Slash Fracture. This was actually my grand piece. And at this time I was really interested in raw clay. Um, I know that this is like the full shot of the installation, um, but they are actually bone dry pieces and they are on situated on plaster slabs. Here's a close up shot of it so you guys can see what it really looks like. And I was kind of experimenting with how clay holds up with liquid. And uh, a lot of us know that bone dry clay totally disintegrates uh, when you put it in water. So I was just playing with the idea of, oh, what if I'm still pouring liquid into it as if it was a fire piece. And I use black mason stain here as the colorant in case I wanted to fire it. Uh, I didn't end up doing that, um, but I used, I chose black because it was a reference to traditional ink paintings. And it was really about the residue and the ephemerality and the unpredictability of it. And a lot of us know that clay and ceramics is super unpredictable at any stage and so I, I was really interested in like I had zero control over what it would do. Um, the way that it would crack would actually be a very dramatic, very dramatic sound. <laughs> um, I did actually record it and have it playing on loop as part of the installation um, and also different clays actually react very differently and it's uh, the one on the left is how uh, what I experimented with and it would kind of crack and leak through the seams and then on the right I used a different clay body assuming that it would do the same thing but it did not and all it did was I think just absorb through the clay and just collapse on itself. It still created a really wonderful form but it, it didn't create that uh, residue that I was looking for. But yeah, um, so my work kind of revolves around my identity and kind of me figuring that out. And, you know, growing up in Vancouver, I felt like I kind of put that behind me. And so through my art, I wanted to experiment and play around with drawing historical references into my work. And yeah, and so on to some of my functional work. Um, this is a tea set. I was really obsessed with Celadon at the time. Um, I was really interested in design. Like I think I made this right after taking my first ceramic design class. And uh, I was really, like I, I just really liked 
designing it and the the coasters of the little teacups would sit in notches in um in the base and then yeah i just had a lot of fun with making at that time and then this is actually a set of five uh a tea set of five um, I, for the life of me could not find that full picture but they, here they are separately um i was really interested in clay body at that time and this is um on the right, it is Navajo, and on the left is actually a clay body uh, mix of 50-50 Navajo, and like the other half is M370. So, and I created this wonderful, uh, beautiful, warm brown color. Uh, and then next up, I have. Hold on. It's not clicking. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Uh, next up, I have some teapots with some patterns on it. And from before, you can kind of see like I'm more, I maybe because I was just in the beginning stages of learning, I just focus more on form and glaze and experimenting that way. And because this was part of an assignment that I needed to use pattern. Uh, this is kind of what I came up with, working with shapes and lines and um, I was actually super excited about this kind of stuff and it's with so much color, it's like super fun. And I hope to um, work more on refining this pattern and playing around with uh, surface decoration a little bit more. Um, and then there was a time I did not want any more round bowls. So <laughs> this is kind of my wave series, if you will. Um, I really, really like the movement it gave and the flow of the rim and how the glaze would kind of just break at the rim. And it, it was, uh, I really, really liked playing with it. And in terms of function, um, it was a nice uh, resting spot for your finger when you're holding and you're eating out of it. And yeah, I really, really liked that. And this was kind of the end of my undergrad. So obviously this is not everything, um, but right after undergrad, I took a job right away and it was teaching kids ceramic classes. And um, I, I mean, after my undergrad, I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And then uh, this job kind of came along and then I took it obviously. Um, and I was just teaching so many kids classes and then eventually did some adult classes. Uh, it was really ridiculous because I was doing like eight to 10 classes a week at one point and I totally burnt myself out <laughs> with doing these classes. Um, but yeah, I just didn't know how to say no. And then that was that. And along with this, I actually um, was an assistant for Heather Dahl. Uh, she contacted me and asked if I was interested. And I was like, of course, yes. And for two years, I learned a lot about the business side of things through her um, more than I did at Emily Carr. Uh, so, you know, I had ideas of thinking about being a production potter. So she was like in Vancouver, like she was like the perfect person to, to have as my mentor. And um, yeah, so the past two years was just me uh, teaching and working for Heather Dahl and really grateful for my time, of course. I mean, half of that was the pandemic, but um, yeah, I'm really excited for my one year residency here at Medelta. Um, I hope to experiment a lot more and I hope to keep myself in clay. <laughs> and so thank you all, uh, that is the end, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Brianne. Thank you so much. Are there any questions for Brianne? Where was that last image taken, Brianne? Oh, so um, I don't know if you guys know Adam Field. He did a workshop in Vancouver one year and uh, uh, a former artist in residence, Jordan, Jordan Monroe and I, we, we went to this, uh, uh, workshop and then we, we took photos like that and it was like super fun <laughs> so yeah that's where the last photo was from cool 
Mm -hmm. I have a question actually. Oh, oh. no work. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I I'm really thank you so much for this uh, inform. I mean, presentation is very nice to having your experience and meeting with you. Are you planning to continue your installations you used to do? They are so engaging and they are, uh, I think they, they are waiting for taking further just social engagement. It's, it's so engaging the way you are bringing people in the gallery space, wide cube and and it would be nice to see your works in the, those kilns areas and then a uh, visitor of the Medalta also. I don't know. It's just I want to, uh, it's like I open a conversation, but those works are so uh, important point, I think, in your production and design and bringing functionality in such a conceptual art. I said not, it's a question, but it's more common. It's just, Thanks. It's oh, congratulations. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In terms of conceptual work, I do like to have more of an interactive aspect to my work. And obviously I use thrown objects. Well, just because I, I, I do love throwing, but I do like to bring that into it. I find, yeah, a lot of us seem to shy away from like, oh, touching or interacting with it. And I, that's why I have installation that, you know, well, for the first piece, you're actually very much engaged in it and then in the second piece it's more like you're interacting with it um i like to further both aspects like conceptually with my installation and also functionally as well um i mean that's what i'm here to do i want to further both uh aspects of it yeah i can do one just a uh different with my own uh, large scale of ex uh, multi pieces uh, installation exp i i've been asked i just i'm just sharing that i've been asked how i can access the how i can make my work more inclusive uh, practicing inclusion to bring also the not diversity in 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 terms of the diversity under the diversity not the diverse but inclusion practicing inclusion diversity i'm gonna say equality and disability yeah. how to bring the, the disabilities also into the wide cube for example your works they have senses water or on fire then how people have the disabilities can engage your work just I want to leave it here, but because I've been shared this, I want to share with you also by the audience that who had the disabilities, why we are not included. For example, I have words on the cups, I add on my cups, why person with the sight disability cannot parts be part of it. Just, okay. It's really funny, the, the, my flow fracture piece, um, that in, initial uh, iteration of the piece was actually me pouring it and us, uh, well, my class at that time, and I would pass it along. And no one had any idea that it would break, obviously, because it was bone dry. So uh, that was an initial uh, iteration of the piece. But I, I ended up kind of furthering it and almost scrapping the idea, but just because it's kind of hard you know, to have, like, for example, do a grad show where it is that, because we didn't have the, you know, I'm not going to be there for, you know, two weeks that it's up for or something, you know, every day. I know, it happens so quick and you have to be very critical. It's yeah. just, there are, uh, not restrictions, but there are possibilities and it's, it's yeah. learning process. It's a learning process. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's great work. It's beautiful work that, congratulations. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Noor. Uh, I think if we don't have any more questions, we'll go on to Amy Duval. Um, Amy is our studio technician here. She's a permanent resident um, from originally North Vancouver. And uh, yeah, she was a student resident here years ago too, 2015, I think. I can't remember now. I'm losing my dates lately, but yeah. Anyhow, yeah. 
All right. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, it's kind of funny. On that note of uh, memory, hey, <laughs> things kind of shifting and moving around a bit. Um, okay. So my name is Amy Duval. Uh, I'm a visual artist. Uh, I was born and raised in North Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, I'm currently based in Medicine Hat, Alberta, where I'm working as a studio technician and also as a resident artist. Um, I graduated from Kaltman Polytechnic University. I did my BFA there and I graduated in 2017. Uh, it was a really small interdisciplinary based fine arts program located in Surrey, British Columbia. Um, so my grad class, I think only had eight people and I was the only one working in clay specifically there. So these are some images of my research process. So since I started working at Medalta, we have a space called the Boneyard here. Um, which is a really great site of research for me. Um, there's a lot of old equipment from when Delta was a functioning pottery factory, and it's left outside and in various heaps and piles um, in varying stages of rustiness and decay. So this site is a space that I visit quite a lot um, to kind of assist me with my installation process. Um, in 27 or 2018, I would say, I learned to plaster lathe um, to make models for slip casting. Um, I learned this from Angelo DePetta and also Narika Masuda. So I use this process to make models um, for slip casting and mold making. Um, and a lot of these models are made in reference to the artifacts um, currently in the bone yard here at Medalta Pottery. Um, they're not direct replicas. Um, and I really look at the plaster laid as a tool for me that kind of allows me to push the forms uh, that I later end up slip casting into a more like ambiguous kind of abstracted territory instead of being directly refer directly referential um, to the mechanical objects that I'm kind of using as my um, resources. Uh, so my work typically happens in stages like everything else in ceramics. Uh, I slip cast um, in a wide variety of molds that I have to create a large quantity or a large vocabulary of objects that I then cut and assemble and attach in various ways. Um, I throw on the wheel to kind of make like the body of the work and then attach all these other elements to it. Um, when I was doing my bachelor's degree, um, I was still making molds of these mechanical objects. Um, and I was really interested in the idea of kind of like wounding them um, and kind of thinking them more in relation to the human body. I was thinking a lot about sites where remains are uncovered and the markings that are left behind on bone that helps kind of tell the history and the story of this object or this person. Um, I was really interested in drawing and painting when I first started my bachelor's degree. So I've kind of always looked at my ceramics as like a form of three-dimensional painting, basically. Um, so these images are some of the first um, bodies of work that I produced in my bachelor's degree, where I was starting to experiment with installing on the wall. Um, I'm involving a lot of different drawing materials as well and kind of experimenting um, the best ways to kind of get these more abstracted drawings on the wall. Um, I was playing a lot with different visual representations of the kind of organized sense of chaos and complexity. Um, when I graduated in 2017, I started drawing directly on the wall with colored slips. Um, this was very much a process of adding and subtracting with water. I was working really quickly and gesturally, um, still in reference to kind of mechanical diagrams and imagery, um, but it kind of acted more in contrast with like the tight wheel thrown elements I was using and then also the slip casting that I was still doing. Um, after I graduated in 2017, I moved to Toronto where I did a residency at Harbour Front Centre in Toronto. Um, this is a shot of an installation I did there entitled Diagrams of Tritus Deconstruct. Um, so this is a combination of like new building methods combined with old methods. So I wasn't much of a hand builder um, in my bachelor's degree, but here I was starting to try and play a little bit more um, and kind of make things in different ways that I hadn't normally done before. Um, I started playing more with like a hard, bright, directional line as a way of kind of adding a more organized uh, layer or systemic kind of approach to the drawing aspect of my work. I was trying to uh, merge that gap between the wall, the drawing, and the ceramic, which I felt was very prevalent. 
um, it was something I was struggling with and kind of still struggling with. Um, I'm also using a lot of like slip trailing and hand building to kind of make fencing and great white forms to frame pieces. Uh, there's a lot of glazing happening and layering of glazing. Um, this was another installation I, or a section of an installation I did in when living in Toronto entitled Paradox, Draft and Verse. So this was um, a part of a group show entitled Ski Whiff, um, which was curated by another artist in residence there. Um, and Ski Whiff kind of refers to things being like off balance, more lighthearted description of the dishevelment that invariably comes with much of life. Um, so this was all about presenting like skewed perspectives and unconventionality in regard to concept, material, and process. Uh, so this was another installation I did upon moving to Medicine Hat. So this actually just occurred uh, in the spring of this year, and it was supposed to be the spring of 2019, but everything got canceled because COVID. Um, but this was able to happen this past spring along with the other year-long artists and residents um, in our program. So this is uh, entitled Bloom and Verse. Uh, I'm thinking a lot about energy and expansion, thinking about an area of intensity that slowly dilutes across a wall. I'm thinking about bloom as a moment of intense potential and beauty, um, kind of like a moment in time when things are opening up to the world, but it's also a moment that's very brief and ends. Um, here I'm starting to introduce sheets of MGF to carry the composition from one wall to the next and kind of acting as like more geometrical kind of framework or I guess kind of like canvas to do my drawing on. Um, the MDF is also just kind of an issue of practicality where I'm trying to make my work a little bit more gallery friendly because I find not a lot of galleries are really excited about you drilling a couple hundred holes in their wall um, and painting with slip on their wall either. Um, so here I've really moved away from glazing um, in my work. Uh, yeah, I decided on white so that there'd be somewhat of an area to kind of like rest, which I find kind of like hilarious, I guess, in hindsight, because I'm like, is your eye really resting that much? Maybe not. Um, a lot of the color choices were made in regards to the brick um, in that gallery space, which was challenging, but also very exciting at the same time. Um, so this work actually um, kind of gave me a little bit of freedom to uh, continue moving forward in preparation for another show that I had this summer um, that was up for a month um, in the Hub Gallery in Arts Place Canmore. So this show was entitled Into Bloom. Um, so again, I'm bringing in a more solid line um, that's kind of more in reference to mechanical instruction manuals that I've still been looking at. Um, so this little install video, um, this is just a bit of information on my actual drawing process. So it is, it is really different from the ceramic aspect of my work. It's something that happens really quickly. It's inky, it's gestural. It's more kind of residing in a place that's like of the whole body instead of I think sometimes ceramics can just be so much um, small movements in the hand. Um, so here I get to play around a lot with like layers of transparency. Um, and it's really just a process of like taping up and then that taping process kind of informs this really inky gestural drawing that goes on top. Um, this process is very much a push and pull between working, working fast and slow. Um, and the pacing changes fairly consistently, um, which is kind of a refreshing change of working, I think. Um, the MGF that I'm using in these works as well is still a bit jarring as I feel like it really still interrupts the consistent level of my drawing surface, which really makes these like full body, like gestural movements um, a little bit more challenging to kind of come back to. Um, which is probably a good challenge in some ways and in other ways it can be very frustrating. Um, so here I'm using wood sheets cut into varying ge geometric shapes that are mounted on the wall that my drawing and my ceramics go on top. Um, I'm trying to find a more practical approach to installing my work. Um, I'm trying to figure out ways that my work can be installed without me potentially having to be there for a really large chunk of time. Um, so this show Into Bloom was a solo exhibition that occurred July to August in Canmore. So I had three walls to install on and I used a combination of wood, drawing media and ceramic. 
Um, this was part of their RISE Emerging Artists Program, um, which supports an emerging artist to put on a solo exhibition in their gallery space. Um, this was a combination of work from the show I did at Madonna, and then also new work that was made after the fact. Um, here I tried to use backdrop colors that were very different from what I typically used before I was doing a lot of like colored slips that were kind of like reds and browns and blacks and really had connections to kind of like more like fills and kind of had a stronger relationship to kind of mechanical like, aging processes like rust. Um, and here I'm trying to use colors that have more of a connection to the wildflower season um, that happened in camera when I was installing this work. Um, ultimately, I really see my work as an attempt for creating metaphors for the kind of simultaneously beautiful and intensely messy nature of the human experience. Um, I kind of want to find a balance between an intense level of chaos and control um, and kind of explore this like imagine marriage between two seemingly oppositional ideas. So the mechanic and the organic. Um, thinking about what these kinds of forms and structures would look like if these two things came together to create a new whole. And that is where I'm at right now. Thank you, Amy. Are there any questions for Amy? Oh, Noor, okay. <laughs> Noor? I'm sorry, tonight I'm very talkative, but I, 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 I believe that I oh, need I like to, it. Uh, we have to, a Amy, I, I, I'm very happy to hear your story from the beginning, how it started and then how it's coming. I, when I saw mm. your work, I was waiting, when I was at Medalta, you were producing and bringing, I was really excited waiting all these things. I would like to, not a question, but I would like to a little bit what I feel I want to say and then bring what I'm trying to say. I see in your work lots of uh, resistance and then the telling us that some things are changing. There is age, there is mechanically. And you describe yourself uh, artist and human. You're a woman human. You're, you have a woman. Uh, but I mean, mm -hmm. I know that you are she and her, so that's why I'm saying with pro our pronouns. And I believe in your work, there is a big voice of feminist theory. I don't want to be very theoretical, but there is, there is, there is something that is not a resistance or political or something, but it has something that your experience being in on the wall or be on the form or as a color as a bringing the history memory there are some you are eliminating and trying to bring us some stories very strong stories that mm. it has to be it has to be heard and told and i personally i mean as an artist as a visual artist and then as a ceramic artist I am very proud of the Medalta has a one woman technician. I'm so <laughs> proud of it. And I find it, I've been so uh, lucky. I found myself very lucky and I find Medalta very lucky. But Medalta's artist very lucky also. If both uh, our coordinator for Nor about Noriko Masuda and you, Amy Duval. And uh, that part is still is very important for me. I, I, I want to hear from you also, what is that part is in your work or how would you increase that part or are you planning to bring also that part more into as a, mm -hmm. in your artist statement or in your uh, explanation? I think it is needed these days more. Thank you again. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nora. Yeah, no, I, I know we talked about it like just really briefly, but like, I think it was like a, the first time I met you, but like I do, I do wonder about that a lot because I feel like, at least for me, I think it's just an inherently political act in the sense that maybe, I don't know if my work is like explicitly political, but just the fact that like 
I identify as female. I make work at a certain scale. I make work in ways that I think like I've had to go into like very masculine or traditionally masculine spaces. I feel like to gather research for what it is that I made. Like I went to a lot of scrap yards, a lot of old car wrecks and auto yards and stuff. And it was very, it was a very masculine space at the time. Like that could be changing, but when I was doing it, um, it, it did feel, yeah, it did feel very masculine. So like, I do feel like just the act of making work and taking up space in the art world. And also like, I feel like trying to work at the scale that I want to work at too, because I started off painting and I was really interested in like historical paintings and the hierarchy of painting. And literally the bigger the painting, the more important it was in this very like specific kind of context. And I always wanted to paint at that scale. And I started doing that. And then I switched gears to working um, with ceramic, but still wanting to work at that scale and take that much space up. And I think about a lot of the other like female ceramic artists that I'm really interested in and how much space they take up. Like they make big work. Um, I really like um, like Raven Half Moon. I don't know if any of you follow, follow their work on Instagram, but she's making like massive stuff. Like I've also really like, I really love um, Linda Sorman's work as well. And just going to see installations that take up that much space and have that much visual power um, to them. And so I feel like for me, like a lot of the like energy and power that I want like connected with my work, I want it to be rooted in that visual complexity and layering and scale and how it's like, you can't ignore this. You can't walk by it and not see it. And so, but I, I do kind of like grapple with that a bit and whether or not like that's explicit in the forms or if it's something that like just comes from the writing or if it's just something that I just, I just live and experience in my body and if that's enough. So I don't know, maybe this isn't really answering the question and now I'm rambling. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, yeah, I think you, 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 you are, you are there though. You, it's, everything is already there, the elements. For example, you are doing a mural. You are not just putting in there. It's, it's already becoming a public art. They are on the mm -hmm. murals are kind of a resistant uh, things they are coming out. It's already mural. And then you have painting also. That 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 painting part is also performative when you install. Mm -hmm. And all these things are already saying many things. So it's 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 not, I'm not saying they are not there. I'm saying that they are there. And then I think it has to be, it is more than uh I receive more than what you are saying, I try to say. I mean, it's, there is this very strong feminist theory about, I, 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 not bad, I, it, and I want to bring it out. And then I think it's a very strong one. And then I just wanted to share that thing and then to see how audience also is receiving that. I believe that, yeah, mm. I can see. Yeah, thank you, Nur. I, I feel like I'm really at a crossroads right now. I'm trying to figure out what to, what to do next. Uh, with my practice and I think really for myself right now I'm like I have a lot of researching to do as well it's just things I've been wondering about and um yeah but yeah thank you thank you any other questions Um, I don't have a question, but I'm, I'm glad that you included that uh, video, the time lapse video, because in some ways your your work isn't an installation, but performative. And it's a pity that that part isn't the show sometimes. So I'm, I'm glad that, that that was included so and people could see that. And, oh, and also that show is still, you can see the virtual tour of that still at Arts Place if anyone wants to check it out. Okay. Um, yeah, that's on until the end, end of December or beginning of January, something like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's, yeah, the virtual tour is until end of December. Um, and I would also like to thank um, uh, one of our current artists and resident, uh, Lael, her partner, Matthew, um, documented that show for me, which I could not go to document. So I'm very appreciative of that. Um, I'll put his Instagram in the chat. So if anyone needs help 
documenting anything. Um, he's a Calgary-based photographer. Um, yeah, but I don't really have a question for myself, but I just think it's really interesting um, just trying to form connections between the three talks that have occurred today. I think, uh, at least for me, memory is very much a part or came up, I feel like, in very different ways um, in each talk. So I think there can be a lot of really interesting conversations, I hope, that can come um, from everyone learning more about each other's work and processes here. That's very exciting. Great, thank you, everyone. Um, we have a few minutes left if there's any other comments or questions. Otherwise, um, we do have, well, thank you so much for being here, all of you, but also we do have another one of these um, artist talks next week, same time, uh, noon in Alberta. I kind of forgot that it's different times everywhere else. So anyhow, uh, on the hour, same time next week, Friday, we'd love you to join. We have three other, fabulous artists, four actually, one of them's collaborative, so four other artists who are gonna be talking next week. So uh, it would be great if you can join us for that. Otherwise, I think, I think that might be it. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you so much everyone and hope to see you next week. <laughs>